How many of you would just be honest and say, I feel like I'm being dragged a little bit through life? Hold it up. Look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. Let's take a pop quiz. Fill in the blank. I'm ready to throw in the... See, now you're giving me the answers you think. This is not the Christmas party thing where you just... I, 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 you got to tell me where you're at. I feel like throwing in the what? What was that? Prayer? Throwing in some prayer? I can't hear you. The vote. <laughs> Come November. I feel like throwing in a vote. I'm at the end of my... Who said something other than rope? What would you say? Witsy. <laughs> I'm just a bundle of... Now, wait a minute. How in the world can it be true in your life that you're ready to throw in the towel at the end of your rope, end of your wits, but yet you are a bundle of joy? My life is... I'm at my wits. I feel like resigning from. You know how many people I'm talking to that feel like resigning from the human race? That feel like resigning from life? It's not one or two. Stress, I need you to hear, is just another word for fear. I need you to understand that. Stress shows up when you say things like, I have too much to do. I can't get it all done. I get tired just thinking about it. Depressed because there's no end in sight. I have no help. There's never enough time. I'm always behind. How many has been saying stuff just like that? Come on, hold it up. Look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. So we have to learn something about this thing called rest. Everybody say rest. rest. See, if all we needed was physical rest, then a nap would fix it. If all we needed was emotional rest, then a vacation would do it. But where do we find spiritual rest? I just heard something like this. The more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> you said it before I could finish it. Now, my dad is convinced that things are going to revert back to the way they used to be. He's still got a box of 1970s bell-bottom ties in the, in the attic that he just is convinced are coming back into style. Do what? They're worth money. Matthew chapter 11, turn there real quick. I'm going to wait on you because this, this, is, this is the crux. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, when I first met Pastor Bob Schaefer, he said Holy Spirit far different than anybody else that I had met at that time. And so he'd say, I was visiting with the Holy Spirit. Now, most people would say, Holy Spirit. Emphasis on spirit. His emphasis is never on spirit. It's always on the spirit that's holy. So Jesus is not saying, take my yoke upon you. He's saying, take my yoke. There's an emphasis Take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. 
How many of you right now are dealing with some burdens? I promise you they're not light. They're heavy. Why? Because they're not his. They're yours. Here's what happens. There are certain things that we don't pass on to our kids until it's time. Hmm? So, Nicholas, I waited until he got some maturity under his belt before I handed him a knife. Exactly right. Because if you, if you give a knife to somebody who doesn't have any maturity, Mom, look! Uh. <laughs> now listen, I gave Stephen a knife. <laughs> not five minutes, not five minutes looking for the first aid kit. I already cut himself. Just cut a finger. I'm just, just got it. I'm Stephen. Five minutes. There are things that we don't want our kids to have to deal with yet. Huh? That's why when you're, when you're trying to decide if you're going to go through the drive-thru and buy some sandwiches, and you know the sandwiches are going to cost $25, and you know you got $27 in the account. You never want your kids to ever suspect or think that there's never going to be enough money for food. So you'll take it and you'll go to the drive-thru to make sure they know what it's like to don't have to worry about this. There's always going to be sandwich money. There's always going to be food money. There's always going to, you're, you're, it's always going to be there even when you know you struggle to see to it that it is there. Y'all catch what I'm saying? Jesus is saying, take my yoke. Because the yoke you've been under is heavy. So I'm asking you to trade. Put your yoke down. Take mine. How many ever gone to the restaurant and you got your kids with you? And you got the big meal and they got the happy meal. But you know their appetite is this big and they got this much food. And you know your appetite's that big, but it doesn't matter. So you swap them. You take the happy meal and you give them the big meal. Oh, y'all didn't do that? <laughs> Be happy, kid. <laughs> huh? Jesus is doing that for us. He's saying, listen, take my yoke. Now listen, if you, if you read Scripture, you understand work is really a part of the curse. Adam really didn't have to work, per se, by the, by the sweat of his brow until they messed things up in the Garden of Eden. So when we see work as a grind, then there's nothing meaningful that comes out of it. That's why, that's why some of y'all, after we get done with church, you're going to want to go find something to eat and hang out with people because that's your last siesta before you've got to punch the clock in the morning. Huh? So you're going to suck all the enjoyment you can out of the weekend? Oh, let me, let me. The weekend. Emphasis on end. So you're trying to have all the enjoyment you can and put off even thinking about tomorrow morning because tomorrow morning is going to get here anyway. Mm -hmm. But even in working, God has made a silver lining that was beaded out on our behalf. He took what was a curse, watch this, and he made it a blessing for us. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So God will even take what was meted out as a punishment and make it a blessing in our life if we take his yoke instead of our, let me, let me just get to the crux here. Some of you are treating your job, I'm going to pick on that one for just a second because most everybody's got one. You're, you're treating your job as your yoke. So because it's your yoke, it's heavy, and you have to drag yourself to get there. You have to medicate yourself with caffeine. you got to get sugar high. Anything you got to do, think about other things while you're doing menial tasks because this is a heavy thing that i got to get through so I can get home and try to relax before i got to do it again. But do you know that if you would learn to set that yoke down and take his yoke, you can go to the same job, dealing with the same people, dealing with the same tasks, but it's lighter, it's joyful, it's peaceful, and you can't wait to get there because it's a different yoke. Amen. 
So some of y'all said, he's playing mind games on the, listen to that. He's just trying to trick us into thinking that we can have fun and enjoy our jobs. It's not a trick. You want to know one of the biggest reasons that I never wanted to be a pastor? Because it's hard work and there's a lot of responsibility. But you know, you know what made it bearable for me? I realized it was not my responsibility, it was his responsibility in and through me. So as long as I set my yoke down to the performance that I think I got to have and simply get up under his and only do what he tells me, I can enjoy the, y'all ain't hearing anything I'm saying. It's the same job, same responsibilities, but it's handled completely different. Well, let me preach to me for a minute. So in Matthew chapter 11, the first thing he says is, come to me. One of the things I want to instill in my kids is no matter how bad the problem is, I want them to want to come tell me. You have a car accident, you get arrested, you get fired, you run out of money, somebody put their hands on you. I want to be the first call. Why? I want them to know that when they call me, it's a safe place. Am I always successful at that? No. But I'm trying really hard. Because I want them to want to bring it to me first, not avoid me. Y'all ain't hearing anything. Why do you think Jesus is saying, come to me, little ones, come to me? Because he knows that our intent is to avoid. I can't tell him that. Oh, my God, he's holy, and I'm not, and I got to. And so we're doing everything we can to be away from him when he's saying, listen, you're violating the whole thing of what I set up. Come to me with it. I know you didn't pay that bill. I know your electric getting shut off. I know you knew you were supposed to change that oil, and you didn't do it till the engine was knock, 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 knocking. Come tell me anyway. Tell me about it. He wants us to perceive him as our safe place, our high tower, our peace, our joy, the place we want to get to. I don't remember what spawned this. Yes, I do. I, I, I saw somebody that reminded me very much of my grandmother that we called Moo. And, well, I called Moo. I think everybody took it from me. That was my name. Anyway. And no matter what's going on in my life as a kid, I wanted to get to Moo and Papa's house. That's a fun place. I got southern sweet tea. I got to shoot a pellet gun. I got to ride the tractor. Didn't matter how much gas I used. Papa would put more in it. Come on. It's a, it's a place I wanted to be. Not that their house was better. Not that it was any cleaner. Not that the food was any more nutritious. It's the fact I just I wanted to be there because I just knew it was, it was a good place for me. Y'all hear anything I'm saying? We want to get to Grandma and Grandpa's house. It's a, it's a vacation without a vacation. And yet we see God not as our safe place, but God to tell him. So Jesus is trying to break this ideology. And he's saying, listen, I want you to want to come to me. <laughs> come try. I know you did it wrong. I know you lied on that application. I know you said some bad words. I know you've been breaking the law. I know all that stuff. Put that down. Take mine. Watch this. Because he said, I've already paid the penalty for what you're carrying. So let me cover that. You take my yoke. Y'all ain't catching any of this yet. It, 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 it's, it's a swap that he's given us. Now, when I got older, I realized Grandma and Grandpa weren't perfect. I showed up to Grandma and Grandpa's house one day as a surprise with my wife. And I walked in the middle of a fight. I hadn't seen them in probably over a year. Oh, it's you. Come on in, Joel. <laughs> Goes right back in and starts fighting. Yeah. I thought, this ain't, this ain't the same place I used to. Yes, it is. It, watch this. It's perspective. And the fact that my perspective was so skewed, 
about how great their life was, our, our viewpoint is also skewed about how bad God is. He's not mean. He's not looking for a way to get us. He's not trying to sideline us. He's trying to bless us. So he tells us, says, come to me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. Anybody weary and heavy laden in the house? You got to come to Jesus. Proverbs 21, verse 31 says, a horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory comes from the Lord. There's an Arabian proverb that says, trust God, but tie your camel. <laughs> trust God, but lock your front door. Trust God, lock your car. People every day are staggering under the weight of the burden of sin, performance. I got to get this done. I can't get behind. Greed, there's never enough. Lust for power, I just got to be in charge. Fame, they need to look at me. Living for yourself, trying to amass more possessions, looking for prominence. Even trying to find pleasure, I just need a happy place. All of this is burdensome. Nicholas Cage, how many knows who Nicholas Cage is? He made this statement. He says, I wonder if there's a hole in the soul of my generation. We've inherited the American dream, but where do we take it? Harrison Ford. Who knows Harrison Ford? Really? Can you give me an article? I'm just kidding. Harrison Ford. His movies have grossed over $2 billion, and he made this statement. You only want what you ain't got. And somebody asked him, said, what ain't you got? Peace was his answer. Peace. See, so many people in the room saying, if I just had enough money, I wouldn't be stressed about all the stuff that I'm stressed about. And the people that have a bunch of money are already there saying, I still don't have peace. You don't have to have money to have peace. But you still got to come to Jesus. Then he says, take my yoke upon you. What is a yoke? I'm not talking about Y-O-L-K, right? I'm not talking about what you get when you crack an egg. How many has ever seen a yoke of oxen? Okay, so it looks like a big M, right? And you put the neck of both oxen in there. Okay, so... When Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, you didn't understand that's not singular. You're not putting just one thing over you. He, he's, he's inviting you to get yoked up with him. Oh. So in a yoke of oxen, if I said yoke of oxen, you automatically know that doesn't mean one, that means so if, if Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you, that he's saying, I'm already, I'm already in this thing. I'm just asking you to be linked with me. You catch what I'm saying? So if we're looking, when he says, take my yoke, if we're looking at the yoke of God, in the same way we look at a yoke of oxen, you and I should be yoked with him. It's also used metaphorically to refer to submission to a teacher. In the New Testament times, if you were spoken of that, hey, I need you to take the yoke of Rabbi so-and-so, that's to say that you were going to be an understudy and that you would be connected with them so that you learn from them. So today, in today's vernacular, man's yoke is rules and regulations. That's man's yoke. Acts 15, 10. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? Rules, regulation, religion, man's yoke. Jesus is about the yoke of relationship. Jesus said that his yoke is easy. That means it's well fitted. It fits the need. It's easy and light. You want to know why most people fail to come to Jesus? Because they don't believe that it's easy or light. They think it's more burdensome than what they've got going on. 
Jesus said you'd find rest if you'd just get yoked to him. <laughs> you know what that tells me? He's doing all the heavy pulling. Because if I can rest while yoked with him, then he's taking the lion's share of the load. That's why he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, if you're ever a pallbearer, get on the side with the big fellas. You say, well, I'm not big like them. That's the point. <laughs> get on the side with the big fellas so they can carry the lion's share of the weight. You can just kind of, huh? That's what Jesus is saying. He said, listen, my shoulder's big enough for both of us. Just link up. I got you. Let's go. My yoke is easy. My burden. Oh. I need to find a way to rewrite that song. Don't you worry about a thing. Every little thing's going to be all right. God's own people who say they love him and are submitted to him and are yoked to him many times don't have the thought process that I don't need to worry about a thing because every little thing is going to be all right. Philippians 4 verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and then thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So which yoke have you been under? Tell the truth. Man's or God's? A yoke pictures three things. One, connection, because God is saying, be with me. Secondly, it's direction. He's saying, follow me. And thirdly, it's cooperation, as he says, work with me. A man by the name of J.H. Jowett summarized this thought this way. He says, the fatal mistake of the believer is to seek to bear life's road in a singular collar. God never intended man to carry his burden alone. Christ deals with only yokes. I think that's powerful for you to understand. God's system requires yokes. He's capable but he refuses to do it outside of being connected with you and I. So the only way that Jesus is going to be released in our lives to do anything powerful is if we come under his yoke. Lastly, he said, learn from me. We don't even begin to learn until we take up this yoke. Psalm 18, verse 32. God arms me with strength, and he makes my way perfect. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, enabling me to stand on mountain heights. He trains my hands for battle. He strengthens my arm to draw a bronze bow. You have given me your shield of victory. Your right hand supports me. Your help has made me great. Let me read those last two verses with a little emphasis. He trains my hands for battle he strengthens my arm to draw a bronze bow you have given me your shield of victory your right hand supports me and your help has made me great we've we've read things in such a way as to has to take out all of its emphasis You ever listen to some people read that were never really taught well how to read? God arms me with strength and he makes my way perfect. I checked out about the third word. God wants us to see his emphasis, watch this, in our life, in what we say, in what we do, in how we portray him. He wants, to, he wants us to have the italics of who he is coming through our life. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, give all of your worries and cares to God. Why? He cares for you. God's willingness to accept us in his yoke is our willingness to accept the finished work of Jesus. The only way you can be yoked up with Jesus is to accept that everything that we have need of, he's already finished. 
Mark Twain said, I'm an old man and I've known a great many troubles, but most of them never happened. One day, a, a man went to see a farmer who was plowing his field with a team of oxen. And he said, I've noticed that one of them is so much larger than the other one. So he asked him about it. And the response from the farmer was interesting. He said that the big animal was the older animal, and it was well-trained, far more trained than the smaller one. In fact, the small one was actually new to the yoke. So the man went on to inquire as to why he put them together. And here's the answer he got. Well, you see, it's like this. The older ox is the best ox that I have ever had. He knows his way around the field. The reason I put the younger one with him is so the older, more knowledgeable ox could teach him how to plow. If I never put them together, the younger one would never learn. By himself, the younger ox would pull himself to death. But together, he learns to cooperate with and rest in the strength of the older ox. Here's what you and I are doing when we're not yoked with Jesus. We're pulling ourselves to death. Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to tie a bow and pray for you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6. So God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. Just based on that passage, how do you enter his rest? Obey him. Verse 7. So God set another time for entering his rest. And that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted, where he said, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. For the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he's the one to whom we are accountable. Isn't it crazy that that famous passage of Scripture that has been taken out of context as many times as it's been quoted is hooked to the passage that says how we enter the rest of God. Because so many of us will say, well, I've been doing that. I've been, I've been submitting myself and, and loving him and obeying him, and I've just not been having that rest. According to this scripture, you're a liar, because if you are falling to obedience before God, then you will enter his rest. And that's why the Bible says that the word of God is sharp, and it cuts between even the intentions of the heart. So that we, we say, well, I did it God's way and it didn't work. It divides it and says, no, you're lying because the word of God is still here and it's working. But here's what you said and it lied on, lied on God. Resting in God is when we get our value and worth from him. Not working to impress our employer, our spouse, our kids, our parents, our grandparents, people that we don't even know, YouTube audiences. We have to learn to get our value from who he is. Let me tell you why that's important. The reason that you're being fought and the enemy's trying to kill you is because of who you are. The problem is most of you don't realize that you're the offspring of God. So you treat yourself as though you're the offspring of the devil. You have that mindset. 
The Bible says you're made in the likeness and image of God. So every time the enemy sees you, he's reminded of your heavenly father. But we're not yet related until you've been adopted. We have to be learned to be yoked to him. That means going where he goes and learning from him. We've heard this thing, you know, before. We've got all things are possible. Here's our problem. We keep trying to do things for him instead of with him. When you do things for God, you're doing it without him. Let me say that again. When you're doing things for God, you're doing things without him. Because anything that God wants you to do, he wants you to be yoked to him and with him. How about this? How many has ever thought of the difference between ministry and the work of the ministry? How many has ever thought of the difference between ministry and the work of the ministry? Ministry is a joy. The work of the ministry will kill you. Work of the ministry is when ministry becomes the taskmaster and you serve the ministry instead of God. And this is where so many ministers are. They're doing the work of the ministry without God. And they're pulling themselves to death. So I have some questions for you today. What if? What if the partnership that God desires is simple obedience on our part and the heavy lifting is on his part? You know how many people think, I don't want to be involved in ministry because there's too much heavy lifting involved in that. If there's heavy lifting involved in ministry, it's because you're doing it wrong. God said he would do the heavy lifting. Y'all ain't hearing anything I'm saying. So what if the partnership God's looking for? He just wants us to obey him. Go where he's going. Learn from him. Let him carry the lion's share of the load. What if our greatest contribution to lasting results is not labor, but listening? I'm convinced that if we'll listen to the Lord, we do a lot less work. Because when we follow the instructions of God, he's given us the bypass. If you do that without me, you've got to go all this away. But if you'll do what I'm saying few steps and you'll be at the end of that anyway you catch what i'm saying (laughs) god's trying to give us some shortcuts what if the hard labor is a sign of those that are doing it all alone and success is the trademark of those that partner with god here's our issue we see people that have success in our eyes And because it's success in our eyes, we suppose that it's success in God's eyes. What if the guy who's got a church of 5,000 feels like he's successful, but God's plan for him was to have 100,000? So he's so far below, he's, he's below poverty in God's estimation and economy, what he's called him to do. But in man's eyes, wow, 5,000. You see what I'm saying? Do you catch what I'm saying? So our, our idea of success is not always God's idea of success. How about the pastor who's got a following of 100,000? But God called him to mentor one. Success is fulfilling God's plan. Not trying to get or do better in man's estimation, in man's economy. 
I have to live in such a way that I'm free from anybody else's yoke. Well, I think you should do it like this. Well, I think, I think you have greater success. Well, oh, I think you should. I have to free myself of all of that because in order to pay attention to those jokes, I've got to set God's down and get up underneath theirs. If they were successful, they'd already be up underneath God's. Y'all ain't hearing this yet. It's okay, and you can agree with that as long as we're talking about me. Let's talk about you. Some of you complaining. Oh, I just don't like this relationship. I mean, I don't like this job. I mean, I don't like the way my kids treat me. I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. What yoke are you under? Because if you were under you, under the yoke you're in, you wouldn't be happy either. You can drive the same car that keeps breaking down on you under your yoke and you get mad. You're up under his, underneath his yoke and he brings people to your aid that are divine appointments that you couldn't go find. Y'all ain't catching anything. God makes this thing easy. He says, listen, listen I've, already t- I've already done it all. I, I have done all the work. I'm just going to lead you on the paved path. If you'll follow me, I'll, I'll just yoke up with me. My burden is easy and it's light. The work that I'm doing on your behalf will be rest for your soul and you'll live longer and you'll prosper and you'll do all these things that you couldn't do on your own. Just let me, let me be the one that leads it. God wants us to have success in all that we do. What if true success is not tied to our effort but instead it's tied to spiritual rest? I think we'd all flunk today. See, whether or not you ever obtain real success depends on your definition of success. There's a lot of people that have earthly success and die young. And there's a lot of people that are never recognized for having any success. But live long. They have joy. They have peace. And they're accomplishing all that God designed for them to do. Genesis 39, verse 3. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. What did Potiphar recognize? He recognized the hand of God on Joseph's life and that it was God who was giving Joseph success. Deuteronomy 8.18, remember the Lord your God? He is the one who gives you the power to be successful in order for, to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. You and I will never experience any true level of success absent being yoked to God. So my question to you today is, who are you truly yoked to? And how do you know? Because everybody in the room wants to say that we're yoked to God. If you were yoked to the enemy, would you want to know? If you were yoked to the enemy, would you want to know? If you'd want to know, raise your hand. One last illustration, and I'm going to pray. I read this earlier today, and I thought, oh, my goodness. The devil appeared to three pastors, and he said this to them. If I gave you the power to change something in the past, what would you change? The first pastor said, with great apostolic fervor. I'd like to prevent you from leading Adam and Eve to sin so that humanity does not separate from God. How many agree with that? The second, a man full of mercy, said to him, I will prevent you from straying from God and condemning you forever. How many likes that one? Nobody's got mercy for the devil. The third of them was the simplest, and instead of answering the tempter, he knelt down, bowed his head, and prayed and said, Lord, deliver me from the temptation of what might have been and what was not. The demon, screaming and trembling with pain, fled, and the other two were surprised and said to him, Brother, why did you react like that? And he answered them, First, we should never talk to the enemy. Now, we'll agree to disagree there. Secondly, no one in the world has the power to change the past. And third, 
Satan's interest was not to prove our virtue, but to trap us in the past so that we neglect the present. The only time God gives us his grace and we can cooperate with him to fulfill his will. Of all the demons, that one holds most men back and prevents them from being happy is what could have been and was not. What could have been and was not. The past is left to the mercy of God and the future of his providence. Only the present is in our hands. Live today loving God with all your heart. I read that for this reason. I believe I'm talking to a group of people in this room today that your yoke is to the past. And because you're yoked to the past, you can't be yoked to Jesus. Well, you don't know what happened. You don't know how they treated you. You don't know what was going on. You, 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 just, you just don't get it. If I'd have just handled that a little bit different, if I had, if I had just waited to have kids, if I'd have just taken that opportunity without offering me that job, if I had just married that other person, if I had just lived in a different state, whatever happened to the Scripture, do we honestly believe it or do we say that as a consolation prize? All things work together for the good of those that love God and to those who are the called according to His. What happened to that? So the path to success is being yoked with God. He cannot and he will not fail. So if we're yoked to him, neither can we. Neither can we. I have rough days and rough weeks and rough nights and just like everybody else does. But something shifts. Even right now with the music that's playing, I can come in the sanctuary and put that music on and just sit down anywhere in the building, close my eyes, lean back, take a deep breath, and just... Because if, forge- if, I'm, if I'm not careful, I forget whose yoke I'm on. I look at what's coming and I think, there's no way. I forget who I'm connected to. Jesus is better than the Dukes of Hazard. When you come up to a big ravine and the enemy's on your tail and you're in a car with some weird guys who just are running for this ravine. And you think there's no way we'll ever make it across. There's no way I'll get out of this debt. There's no way this relationship will work. There's no way I'll get enough money. There's no way my kids are going to act right. There's no way I can fulfill this, this plan that God keeps putting in my heart. Fill in the blank. There's no way. It's because we forgot who we're connected to and we're looking at what we're dealing with while ignoring the answer. We're doing the work of the ministry as though we were working for a principality named ministry instead of fulfilling healing, deliverances, salvations that is ministry. We're serving somebody's idea of success instead of enjoying where you're at. I can't be late and I can't be ahead of time if I'm yoked to him. (laughs) 
(laughs) I can't go the wrong way if I'm yoked to him. I can't mess it up if I'm yoked to him. And how many times do we come for prayer? I think I messed up. I think I did this wrong. I I, I think I got this all messed up. It might look that way, but if we're connected to him, we win. I was thinking about this the other night. I think I've said it before, but if I did, indulge me. When I was a kid, I was never concerned about anybody breaking into the house because I knew they'd have to get through dad, and I knew they weren't going to get through dad. I rested as a kid without any worries unless I'd done wrong and I was waiting on him to find it. You hear what I'm saying? And then one day, the roles changed, and I'm the dad. And I hear a pop or a loud noise, and I'm the one going out there. I know I have weaknesses. Y'all ain't hearing anything yet. I now have to depend on greater is he that's because if Samson can take the gates of a city and run five miles up a hill and laugh at the people that the, of the gates he stole, how much more can I fend off any intruder or any problem that's going on because of his power in me? So again, it's not about if it was just me, we'd all be dead. But it's because of his strength in me that we'll survive. So for those that feel like you're just drowning, things couldn't get any worse. It's horrible. Could it be that you're under the wrong yoke? Could it be you can't even find rest? Because you're not connected to him. God lets us exasperate our wisdom. He lets things get rough. He lets us do things with a long leash because he wants us to come to the conclusion that it's always better under his yoke than anything I could ever do on my own. He wants us to experience him in such a way that I can handle any job, any situation, any problem, any difficulty because I know who I'm connected to, so I can't help but win. When we start thinking I'm about to drown, I'm going to die, things are getting terrible, it's not going to get any better, when we start thinking those things, it's because we walked away from the yoke that God designed for our life. We keep trying to do the work of the ministry, and ministry's not getting done. So if you're, if you're in this room right now and you know the yoke that you've been under has not been his and you want to swap it today, lay yours down and pick his up, I want you to stand right where you're at. Been trying to do things under your own power, doing it your way, your wisdom, not finding joy, not finding peace in what you're doing, not letting him do the heavy lifting. (laughs) He wants to so bad. Lord, I'm asking you today to come right up alongside each one that's standing. And that you by your Holy Spirit would unlatch us from every yoke that we're connected to. The opinions of others, job performance, comparison we always find ourselves coming up short not knowing what to do that's because we're trying to do your job Lord so as we stand here today 
we're affirming to you again. We got away. And we're asking today that you would let us back into your yoke. Because God, we need to get out of where we're at. We're exhausted mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, materially, socially. Because we're doing the work instead of listening and letting you work through us. So I speak right now to all heaviness, uh, unfulfilled expectations, worry, anxiety, everything that says you're drowning, you're going to die. You can't finish this. And I demand your res resignation right now from the lives of every person who's standing to receive. And Holy Spirit, I'm asking you today to come up alongside them right now and affirm your presence to them. Affirm your presence to them. And may we sing with new conviction the old song, where he leads, I will follow. I'm asking today, Lord, for supernatural rest for our bodies, our minds, our spirits. Teach us how to relax and let you function through us instead of us trying to force you to do what we think needs to happen. We choose to trust your way, your wisdom, your plan, your provision. Make us ever mindful of your care, your protection, your presence. In Jesus' mighty name. And all those in agreement said, amen. For those that caught any part of this stream, thank you for joining with us. If you're looking to find a church home, we'd love to grow the family. 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. Every Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Every Thursday evening at 6.45 p.m. So until our next appointed time together, God bless you. Have an incredible day.